Okay, before I say a word, I want you to watch this clip from Princess Mononoke and try to absorb this scene if you can. Perfect. And now take a look at this clip from the movie Tangled. Alright, so did this feel any different from this or did you find them to be similar? I have been watching a lot of animation of late and I feel like at some point when you watch things on repeat, you start noticing things that you had never really paid attention to before. And it was through such a series of thought processes that I arrived at these two scenes. Now, as far as similarities goes, apart from the fact that I really love both these movies, the setting of these two scenes are very similar although these two scenes take place under different contexts. But nevertheless, you have a main character laying on the grass in the middle of a forest with insects flying around them. But for some reason, the more I watch these two scenes, they almost keep drifting away from each other. While this scene feels more magical and like a fairy tale, the other one feels more natural and reminiscent and therefore much more honest. And so I thought about it. Why could it be that two similar scenes depicting a natural environment feel distinctly different from one another? And then, like clockwork, I came across familiar scenarios where environments would look the same on the surface but would feel completely different underneath. One after another, scenes involving nature just felt a hundred times better under Studio Ghibli than Disney. But why is that? In order to truly understand why Studio Ghibli's depiction of nature is fairly accurate and better than other studios, you have to examine the different dimensions of nature and how we acknowledge them. Classically speaking, the sensory information that we gather from the outside world is channeled into your brain through five different senses. Through your eyes, which is your vision, through the nose, your sense of smell, through the ears, your hearing, through the tongue, which is your taste, and through the skin, which is your sense of touch. Now, all these senses combine to make sense of the reality around you. But the extent to which we use these senses is entirely dependent on the environment that you're in. It's not surprising that your sense of taste doesn't really impact how you cross a road. And in a similar fashion, if you see a snake, your sense of touch isn't very useful. But to put this into context with the natural environment, let's imagine a forest. While you're inside this forest, the sense that you rely on the most is unsurprisingly your vision, which gives you the most accurate representation of the trees and the grass growing around you. But the forest also produces sounds that are palpable for the ears and smells that can be detected by your nose. And for whatever reason it is that you can't depend on these senses, you can feel the texture of a tree through your sense of touch to further discern the characteristics of the forest. But almost rarely, if at all, would you feel the need to use your sense of taste. And this is a real world scenario of how someone would likely experience a forest. So why am I going on a tangent talking about the different sensory inputs and their functions under different scenarios? Well, the point that I'm trying to make is that in order for your brain to process an environment to the fullest, to portray what is an accurate representation of it, it prioritizes certain senses more so than others. Now, keep this in mind for a second. In the real world, nature has different discernible dimensions such as color, smell, sound, texture, and even taste through which we experience nature to the fullest. But when this representation of nature transfers from the real world to the movie screen, by default, the few dimensions of nature such as smell, texture and even taste are completely lost, leaving us with a sense of perception and hearing. And this premise is the key to understanding the art of a Ghibli environment. Now going back to this scene, the reason why this portrayal of nature is far better than this version is primarily because of that one extra dimension, the dimension of sound. Sounds are an integral part of cinema. If the visuals explains the story, sounds bring life into it. There's so much information that you can gather from the sounds of a particular scene. It gives a certain degree of weight and tempo to every scene such as in this scene from Sherlock Holmes or this scene from Harry Potter. 
but the music defines the mood in these two scenes. It's the ambient sounds that sets up the environment. But for a medium like animation, sound design is even more precious. Animation often conveys a slice of fantasy that is much further from the real world. And in order to make this fantasy into something relatable, you have to tie it up with something that is grounded in reality. Sounds. And this is where Studio Ghibli stands out from the crowd. Look, I have no doubts that the sound design in Western animation is incredible. And I'm pretty sure you could name your favorite soundtracks or scenes that would fully justify this statement. But when it comes to scenes that portray nature, the sound design of Studio Ghibli is inexplicably brilliant. Now, going back to these scenes, this scene from Tangled begins as a fading transition, and as the camera sort of pans in, you start hearing the ambient sounds in the background. You hear the sounds of the birds and the insects, effectively the many sounds of the forest. But only 3 seconds into this scene, the ambient sounds fade away into the background as an elegant fairy tale type of music overpowers it. And although the ambient sounds of the forest still persist in the background, it is in fact this music that drives the mood of this scene, which is later confirmed as the music transitions from a relaxing style to a dramatic one. The strong emphasis on the music in this scene implies more importance to the characters and the plot than the environment in which it takes place. And now let's see how Princess Mononoke deals with a similar scene. Now this scene begins with a sudden transition. On the screen now is a tree covered in moss and dew. And as we wait for a moment to see what had happened to Prince Ashitaka, a droplet of dew falls off the screen and it lands on top of Prince Ashitaka's face who lay in the grass. But notice how elegant this scene is despite of the lack of music. The only sounds that we hear until this point is the sound of the droplet of dew falling from the tree and then a second later landing on Prince Ashitaka's face. Prince Ashitaka opens his eyes and now you hear the sound of the flowing river fading in to accompany the chirping of the birds and the insects. And as the ambience of the forest comes alive, notice how you still haven't heard a single musical note. The stillness of this environment isn't uneasy, but in fact, it is necessary to portray the impact that nature has on people. And Miyazaki achieves this desired effect by letting the story run without dialogue or music for more than half a minute. Something that you'd probably never see in a Disney movie. The sounds of nature alone is enough to convey the meaning here. Prince Ashitaka is part of this environment, rather than the other way around. Throughout Ghibli movies, you'll find moments where nature takes center stage, only accompanied by the ambience of the environment alone. And it's not because Studio Ghibli is afraid of using the soundtracks, as we all know how beautiful they are, but rather, it is to let these moments play out organically. Sometimes when you portray nature, you don't need dialogue. You don't need to describe the beauty of the things around you. It is a common feeling that we share as a species, and you just have to portray it the way it is. But in Disney movies, or for the most part of Western animation, you hardly find moments such as these. A lot of the time, environmental scenes are overshadowed by a soundtrack, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but it takes away that visceral connection that we have with nature. And this nicely sets up another aspect of Studio Ghibli's nature that explains the impact that it has on people on a much deeper level. It is called biophilia. A term that was introduced by the American biologist Edward O. Wilson in his famous book Biophilia, in which he defines biophilia as an instinctive need for humans to find comfort in nature and other forms of life. Because human beings co-evolved with nature, we are always drawn to it to seek comfort and happiness. And if you have a glance at Ghibli movies, you'd see shades of biophilia scattered across its environments. The very best of this aspect of nature is found in one of Miyazaki's earlier movies, My Neighbor Totoro. This is effectively, in many ways, a children's movie, and such is the playful nature of this movie for the most part of its duration. But there is also a beautiful simplicity to the movie that is appreciated by an older audience as well. The world of My Neighbor Totoro creates a deep sense of nostalgia and reminiscence of simpler times. 
Through the movie and its characters, it reconnects us with the natural world, something that a lot of us have lost through the frequent urbanization of the world around us. And I do believe that had this movie been set in an urban world, it probably wouldn't have had the same impact. My Neighbor Totoro exhibits a simplistic and romanticized version of nature, something that can be considered as a cross-section of all Ghibli movies. But in Western animation, you hardly see portrayals of nature that are romanticized. More often than not, it serves as a means to another, or simply as an instrument to advance the plot. But movies like My Neighbor Totoro connects the characters with nature. Mei and Satsuki are driven by the exploratory curiosity that every child has of the natural world. Throughout the movie, they form these incredible relationships with nature and are therefore connected to nature on a fundamental level. And our past experiences and childhood memories would suggest that we have had a similar relationship with nature when we were kids. And it could be that when we see a natural environment portrayed in the most organic way possible, it takes us back to when we were kids. When we were the ones exploring nature like the characters in My Neighbor Totoro. It could be a reason why we find this movie to be incredibly soothing. The whole premise of this movie is about how visceral interactions with nature or biophilia helps to heal people. The movie deals with a deep emotional issue. How do children cope mentally without a motherly figure in their lives? And throughout this movie, the children find comfort in nature. And in many ways, in the absence of a mother, it's the nature around their new home that helps them be children in a stressful time within the family. But this warm and fuzzy feeling that you get when you watch My Neighbor Totoro extends beyond the television. A study that was conducted in 1984 by Roger Ulrich measured the effect that natural sceneries had on patients recovering from gallbladder surgery. In the study, some of the patients were offered a window with a natural scenery in their rooms, while some of the other patients had more of an urban view such as brick walls. And with all the other variables being quite similar, the study showed that the patients who were exposed to nature exhibited accelerated recovery rates and reduced stress compared to the patients with the urban view, thereby showing that nature does have a positive impact on the body as well as the mind. And this impact that nature has on people is easily understood by the average human. Be it a child or an adult, this quality resides deep within our psyche. And therefore, it is a very powerful tool for storytelling. And such is the capability of a master craftsman like Hayao Miyazaki that he uses this quality of nature to bring us closer to his stories. It is a very simple process, but when done correctly, it is something that induces powerful emotions. And this is why Studio Ghibli's nature, even without doing too much, is capable of transfixing you to a moment of tranquility, more than any other animation style out there. There is an authentic appreciation that's shown towards nature in a Ghibli movie which transforms the way you think about the human-nature relationships. But like I mentioned before, you'd hardly find such an aspect in Western animation. And this is why it is perhaps something that goes beyond the movies and extends vastly into even broader topics such as culture and religion. And as such, this opens up a fascinating debate between the Eastern world versus the Western world and how cultural differences impact how the perception of nature is conceived in cinema. Over the course of hundreds of thousands of years of evolution, nature has had a positive influence on our species as a whole. But as time went by, the different ways in which groups of people interacted with nature changed. While some grew closer to nature, forming close connections that you can still see to this day, others, by no fault of their own, sort of got disconnected with this visceral feeling. Nature for a lot of people became gods and spirits, which they formed religions and cultures around, while for others, nature became photographs and sceneries that one would visit on vacation. And as someone who is considered traditionally to be from the East, this is not me saying that one is better than the other, but merely an observation of how nature impacts people's lives in the West versus the East. I've lived in what is considered the East for most of my life and I've also lived in the West for quite some time as well. And from what I have seen, the way people interact with nature is very similar in many ways from a psychological point of view. 
Nature offers the same sort of relaxation no matter who you are. This much was true, but looking at it from a cultural point of view, these interactions were nothing alike. And this is because in Eastern religions, nature is oftentimes considered as sacred and a place of worship, whereas in the West, nature is just a place you visit. And again, as I keep saying, there is nothing wrong with that mindset. Just because nature is a place that you visit doesn't mean that people aren't in tune with nature. But what I'm merely suggesting is that this premise is what extends into the various facets of life, be it in the East or the West. This very idea forms the basis of how nature is portrayed in cinema. Like I said before, cinema is a reflection of the culture of a specific region. And one could easily see how Hollywood is a cross-section of American culture, where most of the movies consume a fast-paced environment. But in a similar way, anime is representative of Japanese culture, where there is a mixture of technology and fast-paced action on one side, but on the other, there are moments of purity and calmness. Qualities that are associated with some of the oldest traditions and cultures in Japan. But none is far more definitive in this context than one of Japan's oldest religions, Shintoism. Shintoism is one of the few religions out there which could be considered as an animistic religion, where one believes that objects, places, and even creatures, be it animate or inanimate, possess a distinct spiritual quality. To conceptualize this, in Shintoism, a rock is as much alive as a tree. And in this system originates the idea of kami or spirits that inhabit these objects. The kami are connected with nature and they are believed to exist in various aspects of the natural environment. Sometimes they represent the forces of nature as in the wind or elements of a landscape like a river or even living beings such as a creature or a plant. And this is why, in more ways than one, nature plays a central role in Shinto. And it is this beautiful connection between humans and nature, derived from Shintoism, that creates the environments of your favorite Ghibli movies. According to Hayao Miyazaki, we don't subordinate the natural setting to the characters. That is because we feel the world is beautiful. Human relationships are not the only thing that is interesting. We think that weather, time, rays of light, plants, water, and wind, what make up the landscape, are all beautiful. That is why we make efforts to incorporate them as much as possible in our work. This love for nature derived from Shinto is a recurring theme that spans across all Ghibli movies. In Spirited Away, a road through a dense green forest takes Chihiro's family past stone spirit houses and torii gates, which are symbolic of Shinto, that marks the presence of a spirit world nearby, which eventually the family enters into. The nature beyond this spirit gate consists of a lush green carpet of greenery with rolling hills and small streams nestled in this landscape, all that seem mysterious and untouched, and therefore pure and sacred. And in Princess Mononoke, when Prince Ashitaka enters the forest of the forest spirit, he comes across what are known as Kodama. In Shinto, these are spirits that inhabit the older trees, and they are also known to give the tree a personality. And it was also considered in a pre-modern Japan that anyone who cuts down an old tree would be met with the wrath of an angry spirit. Again, the imbalance of this nature-human relationship is what forms the basis of Princess Mononoke. And it is only when this balance is restored that the world returns to being normal. But I believe that the most conspicuous evidence of Shinto or the love for the natural world is found in a scene from My Neighbor Totoro. In this scene, after Mei emphatically proclaims that she saw a Totoro, a mystical spirit that lives in the forest, her father doesn't deny this claim made by a four-year-old, but rather he believes her. And he takes the kids to the nearby shrine to pay their respects since Mei had seen the king of the forest. And as they reach the top of the hill, they arrive at the foot of a giant camphor tree. Camphor trees in Japan are considered to be sacred as they are believed to be inhabited by spirits. And as an example in real life, there is a camphor tree situated at Kayashima railway station that's thought to be over 700 years old. And the sanctity shown towards this tree meant that the station had to be built around it. And for me, although I don't live in Japan, such a story is quite relatable, because instead of camphor trees in India, or at least the place where I'm from, there is a similar sense of sanctity shown towards the sacred fig. 
which is also referred to as the Bodhi tree. And by name, it is believed to be the tree under which Buddha himself found enlightenment. And you can find these trees in Hindu temples and Buddhist temples across various parts of Asia. The sacred fig, just like the camphor trees, can live up to hundreds of years, with some growing to be over a thousand years old. And while doing that, it is quite natural for generations and generations of people to naturally grow fond of these trees and be drawn to its almost immortal quality. And such is the camphor tree that you see in this scene, which is confirmed by Mei and Satsuki's father. He believes the camphor tree has been around for over hundreds of years, back in the time when trees and people used to be friends. And the reason why he chose to move to this place was mainly because of this tree, because of the nature around it, because it would be the perfect place for his healing wife, and the perfect place to raise the kids. And through this dialogue, what we are seeing is the ideology of Miyazaki, someone who idealizes the concept of nature and humans coexisting in harmony. As someone who is old enough to have seen a different version of nature, something unspoiled and sacred, when people paid respect and love towards it, through his movies, Miyazaki simply wants to bring that spiritual connection back into people. And this is why the Ghibli landscapes has an element of soul attached to it. This is why you feel calm and happy when you watch a scene such as this. In a Ghibli movie, being within nature is not a task, but it is as lazy and relaxing as a childhood memory of ours. And that's what leads to moments like these. In this scene from Howl's Moving Castle, this scene adds nothing to the plot of the story. But yet, Miyazaki is so adamant in creating this scene anyways, because he knows the importance of connecting the viewers with nature. And this is a recurring theme in almost all his movies. Even if the ideologies of Shinto is not directly implied, Miyazaki always ensures that he captures nature in its purest form for us to be swept away by its spell. And this is why in a Ghibli movie, nature is a character. It has a persona of its own. Be it this giant camphor tree in My Neighbor Totoro or this giant wave in Ponyo. But in Western animation such as Disney, although nature can take the shape of a character, the personification is often oversimplified. You don't normally see the subtleties or plurality of nature, and therefore, you don't get moments of tranquility such as these. They are always scenes in the background or elements that are considered as good or evil. They don't act as a medium for the viewer to wish they were there in that moment, in that particular scene, sitting without a care on a chair beside a lake such as this, or painting a portrait on a green grassy hill under a clear blue sky such as this. These moments don't impact the story. What does it mean for the protagonist to lay in the grass for a whole minute? Could you not create such a scene at all? Possibly, the story would still make sense. But would you feel that same comfort though? Or could it possibly have the power to make your day better? Probably not. And I fully believe that one of the main reasons why I'm drawn to these movies, the reason why I come back to them over and over again is primarily because of moments such as these. And moments such as these are something that requires no dialogue, or in some cases, not even music. In these moments, Studio Ghibli shows us that nature, no matter how fantastical it seems, can still be experienced through a TV screen. And then, you'd fade away into these landscapes and become part of its beauty.